Hello, welcome back. We're working with imaginary numbers. In the last lesson, we introduced what an imaginary number is, but more importantly, I motivated for you why we care about imaginary numbers and how useful they are in real math, even beyond algebra, in real engineering and science and math. So go back and watch that last lesson if you haven't already done so. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to start to simplify expressions that have imaginary numbers. So if you remember, the imaginary number i, we define it to be the square root of negative 1. And because of that, if I square both sides of this, when you have the imaginary number i squared, then it is equal to a real number negative 1. Both of those facts are equally important for you to know. You need to know that i is the square root of negative 1, and you also need to know that i squared is equal to negative 1. So let's just crank through a bunch of problems and you'll see why you need to understand both of those as we go along. If you have negative 81, for instance, and we're going to take the square root of that, what you do is you completely ignore the negative sign at first, and you take the square root of the number. Well, the square root of 81 is 9. You could do a factor tree, 9 times 9, and circle a pair, but you know that it's equal to 9. And then because of the negative, you're taking the square root of that negative 1 as well, which is i, and it lives right behind the number. So the answer is not 9, it's 9i. So this is a pure imaginary number, 9 times bigger than the base imaginary number that we have. What if you have the problem of negative 4 times the square root of negative 36? We treat this step-by-step uh, step as we do with any expression. The negative 4 is going to be multiplied by something, and that something is the square root of negative 36. The square root of 36 is 6, and the square root of the negative 1 is i, so we actually get 6i here. And so we have negative 4 times 6i. It turns out you can multiply imaginary numbers just like you multiply um, any old number. Basically what you're doing is you're multiplying the coefficient, and you almost treat this as if it were a variable. So negative 4 times 6 is negative 24 times what? Times the i that's there. You just basically treat it like a variable. But this is not a real number. i is, in, is an imaginary number, so this is negative 24 times the base imaginary number that we have. Now what if we have negative 20, and I would like to take the square root of this? Now, for the more complicated ones, not a perfect square, we have to do a factor tree. So go down here and do a factor tree, but do not try to write a factor tree with negative numbers here. You just ignore the negative completely. You say 5 times 4 is 20, and 2 times 2 is 4. And you circle the 2's, just like you would always do. Then you say the single 2 can come out, the square root of the 5 will be left over, but because we have the square root of negative 1, that also has to come out as an i. So we write it in front of the radical, 2i times the square root of 5. All right? What if we had uh, 3 times the square root of negative 8? Well, we go and try to do a factor tree. You probably know this. We've done it enough. And you ignore the negative sign. We say 8 is 2 times 4, and 4 is 2 times 2. So we have a pair of 2's there. And so we can say that we ignore that, the negative completely. A single 2 would come out, but don't forget the 3 is out here. So we have 3 times whatever is inside of here. The 2 comes out. The 2 is left over, so that stays under the radical. But because we're taking the square root of negative, that comes out as an i, which you write it in front of the radical. Now you have 3 times this quantity. You multiply the numbers, giving you 6i on the outside, square root of 2. This is the final answer, 6i times the square root of 2. So you see, working with imaginary numbers is actually not hard at all, uh, as I'm trying to show here. Now we'll switch gears from taking the square root of negative numbers to what happens when we start multiplying these negative, these imaginary numbers together. What if we have 2i multiplied by 3i? All right, what you have to know here is that when you have uh, imaginary, imaginary numbers multiplied together, you basically pretend that the i is a variable. You all know how to multiply, for instance, 2x times 3x. You multiply the numbers together, and then you multiply the variables together, and x times x would give you x squared, right? So we kind of do that initially with this, uh, and so you say 2 times 3 is 6, and then i times the i gives me i squared. But we have to take it one more step further, because we know i squared, we just have to remember it in our mind. Anytime you see an i squared, you have to substitute in the value of negative 1, because it's always equal to negative 1. So what I would say is 6 times negative 1. I would write it just like this, replacing the i squared with negative 1, which gives you negative 6. That's the answer, negative 6. So when you have two imaginary numbers multiplied together, you can often get a real number back. All right? Now what I want to do is go over to this board, and I want to uh, uh, do some problems that involve imaginary numbers, but when we're multiplying radicals. Remember, we had entire lessons dealing with multiplying radicals together, and we want to mix in the concept of multiplying radicals when we also have imaginary numbers. We're just taking it one step further to give you a little more practice. 
So let's say you have the radical square root of 7 multiplied by the square root of negative 7. Right? Square root of 7 times square root of negative 7. Well, the square root of 7 I can't really do a factor tree for. I'm going to leave it here. But the square root of negative 7 you now know. What is that? Well, the square root of the negative 1 comes out as an i, and the square root of the 7 has to stay behind because I can't simplify that anymore. So what you have here is the i is going to float out in front, and you're going to have square root of, and when you have two radicals with you know, numbers underneath them, you can multiply those together to make square root of 49. And so what you're going to have at the end of the day is i, let's write it up, well, yeah, i times uh, 7, the square root of 49 is 7, so it'd be i times 7, but you always write it with a number in front. So you say that 7i is the answer. That's the final answer, okay? What if we have something similar? Instead of a positive here and a negative here, let's change it up where the problem is a little more complicated. Let's say you have negative 5 multiplied by, under a radical, times negative 10. So again, let's take the square root of each of these individually. The, the square root of this is going to be uh, i times the square root of 5, because I can't really simplify this anymore, so the i comes out when you take the square root. 2 times 5 is 10. I can't simplify that either, so I'm going to multiply that i times the square root of 10. That's what this one's going to be equal to. But then when I multiply all this together, what I'm going to get is i times i, which is i squared. And I'm going to have the square root of 5 times the square root of 10, but I can multiply under the radical to give me the square root of 50. Right? Square root of 50. So then I'm going to go over here and do a factor tree for 50. Well, I have uh, 2 times 25, and then 25 is 5 times 5. So I have a pair. So there I go. I have a pair. And then finally, uh, what I'm going to get over here, this i squared is negative 1, so I'm going to replace it with a negative 1. It's always equal to negative 1. And then the square root of 50 has a single 5 that comes out and a square root of 2 left over, because that's what's left over. So the negative just multiplies. Negative 5 square root of 2. So the answer is negative 5 times the square root of 2. Now, I wanted to do both of these problems on the board because I want to caution you something extremely, extremely um, uh, interesting. And also, it's a gotcha. I really want you to be aware of Here's the punchline. Anytime you have radicals, like square roots or whatever, with negative numbers underneath it, the kind of the order of operations or the priority order is, I want you to deal with each radical separately, and then if you're going to be multiplying radicals, then you can do that later. So for instance, in this case, we had the square root of 7, we couldn't do anything there. What we did is we said, okay, let's make this i times root 7, then we can multiply the radicals, and then we continue. Or here, we turn this one into i root 5, we turn this one into i root 10, then we multiplied under the radicals, and so on, and got the answer. Re remember, many of you will remember what we've already learned in the past, that when we combine radicals, what we say, I'll put a note here, is that the square root of a times the square root of b, remember, any two radicals multiplied together, was equal to the square root of a times b, right? So th we did that here, right? We did 7 times 7 was the square root of 49. We did 5 times 10 was the square root of 50. We've been using this rule a lot. What I didn't mention back in that lesson, because it wasn't relevant until now, is that this rule is really only supposed to fo be followed when what is under these radicals are positive numbers. Because prior to now, having a negative number under the radical made no sense. Until now, we have imaginary numbers, of course. So when we combine radicals, the a and the b should be positive in order to be able to combine them under a common radical like this. So over here, I'm going to amend this rule, and I'm going to say a and b positive. Let me show you how you can get into trouble if you don't obey this rule, okay? Let's go up here to the previous problem. The original problem was ne square root of negative 5 times negative 10. All right, so I'm just going to combine these radicals straight away. I'm going to say negative 5 times negative 10 is positive 50. So positive 50, square root of positive 50, is, is, is just going to give me what I have here, square root of 50, which would just give me 5 times the square root of 2, but I would have no i squared anywhere. You see, if I follow this rule that I taught you for radicals, with negative numbers under the radical, when I multiply them, I'm going to get a positive square root of 50, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get a positive answer here instead of a negative answer. So what we want to do is follow the rule, it's fine, but just turn each radical into its imaginary number first before you combine any radicals together. Now it turns out in this one, 7 times negative 7 is negative 49. So if you take the square root of negative 49, you're actually still going to get 7i back. So technically it does work if one of them is positive and one of them is negative and all that, but really the rule of thumb I want you to remember because it's, it's the easiest thing to remember is that you can combine radicals like this as long as you have positive numbers underneath. 
Okay, no problem. And the second rule is if you have negative numbers under a radical, always, always, always deal with those radicals and make them into imaginary numbers first, like we did in both of these problems before combining anything in the final answer. Otherwise, you might run into problems getting, getting the wrong sign of your answer. I wanted to caution that to you. Okay, so let's move on now that we've got all the um, kind of the basics out of the way. And we're going to crank through a bunch of additional problems just to give you practice. What if we have 7 times i as a quantity and we're going to square that? Well, we're going to, the square is going to apply to the 7 and it will also apply to the i. So it would be 7 squared i squared. But 7 times 7 is 49 and i squared is always negative 1. So then I can multiply those and say the answer is negative 49. This is the answer. All right. Next problem. We're just going to crank through a bunch of them. None are really any harder than the other. What if I have negative i? quantity squared. A lot of students get tripped up by this, but you can think of it, you can bust it on out if you'd like and think of it as well, this is negative i times negative i because it's the quantity that's squared. So it's this times itself. But then you, you know that negative times negative is positive and you know that i times i is i squared. So you really get a positive i squared. But you know that i squared is negative 1. So that's going to be the final answer. That's negative 1. All right, another way you can do, of course you can do what I've done here, but you can all, always think of things different ways. Or you can write or think uh, as follows. This negative i here can be written as negative 1 times i, right? Negative 1, negative one times i is negative i, uh, negative i, and that whole thing can be squared. This is what this is equal to. Then you can say, well, the square would then apply to the negative 1, and then it would also apply to the i. This is going to give you a positive one, but this is going to give you a negative one, and so that's the final answer. So if you want to think of it like that, or if you want to multiply them together, you're going to get the same answer, uh, of course, both ways. Moving right along, what if we have i times the square root of 2, quantity squared? Again, the square applies to the i, and the square applies to the square root of 2 separately. So square root of 2 gets its own square here. It just goes in and applies to everything, but this gives me a negative 1. And this, the square cancels with the square root, just giving me a 2, so I get negative 2. It's very important when you're doing this stuff to write it all down. See, notice I didn't go in here and say, oh, this is negative 1, and just do too many things. I wrote it all down so that I wouldn't make any sign errors. All right, what if I have negative 1 times the square root of 3, quantity squared? This can go and apply to the negative, uh, I'm sorry, negative i. This is supposed to be negative i times the square root of 3. It can go and apply to the negative i, and then it can apply to the square root of 3, quantity squared. Now what is this? This is going to be uh, negative i times negative i, right? Which is going to give me positive i squared. And then this cancels the square and the square root here. But this is a negative 1 times 3, so really I get a negative 3. That's the final answer there. So up until now, we've had no real fractions involved. We've just had either things being squared or imaginary numbers multiplied by another imaginary number. But what if we change the game a little bit and say, what if I have negative 2 over i, uh, and I want to simplify that? Well, you might look at that and say, well, it's already simplified, right? Because it's, you know, it's just a negative 2 on the top and an i on the bottom. There's not much else I can do. Here's another rule of thumb I need to throw at you. Remember when we were simplifying radical expressions? We said we never, ever want a radical in the denominator of a fraction. We always want to get rid of it by by doing multiplying by the conjugate or whatever to get rid of the radicals. So the same thing is true of imaginary numbers because when you think about it, this is a radical. I mean, this is a square root of negative one. So we don't want that in the bottom, just like we don't want any radical in the bottom. So what we have to do is multiply this by something. Negative two over i. And it's very, very simple. All you do is you multiply by the imaginary part that you have in the top and in the bottom because all you're doing is multiplying by one. But you see what's going to happen. When you multiply the bottoms, you're going to get i squared. When you multiply the top, you're going to get negative 2i. But then on the bottom, you know that i squared is just negative 1. And these divide away and give you a positive 2i. This is the real answer, 2 times i. This 2 times i is exactly the same thing as this negative 2 divided by i. They are the same thing. But we consider this to be more simplified because there's no imaginary number in the bottom which means there's no radical in the bottom. So we want to get, we want to do that. And, and we always clear it the same way. We just multiply by whatever the imaginary part is over itself. Final problem. Uh, what if we have 8 over 3 times i? And I say simplify that. Same sort of thing. I want to get rid of the i that's in the bottom there. 
So I'm going to rewrite my problem. And of course I could multiply by 3i over 3i. I could do that. I mean, it's going to be give me the same answer. But really I'm only required to multiply by the imaginary one, the imaginary part, whatever it is, divided by itself. All right? I'll probably do it both ways just to show you here. But let's just go and do this. What I'm going to get here is 8 times i on the top. And on the bottom I'll get 3i squared. Right? But I know what 3i squared is equal to. I have 8i on the up here. This is negative 1. i squared is negative 1. So really I have a negative 3 on the bottom here. So the answer that you would really circle on your test, you can float this negative sign in front, 8i over 3. This is what I would write. And this is considered to be more simplified than what I had here. But I want to caution you that here I multiply by i over i, but you can of course do it, you can do it uh, as follows. You could say 8 over 3i. I can multiply by 3i over 3i. A lot of students will do this, just multiplying by the whole denominator. It works fine too. Okay, 8 times 3 is 24 times i. This is 3 times 3 is 9 i squared. All right, so when, what I'm going to have is 24 uh, i over, and this is negative 1 times 9, so negative 9, negative 9. And then you have to do some simplification of fractions, right? Because 24, if you divide it by 3, is going to give you 8. So you have the negative sign floating up in front, so divide this by 3, you're going to get 8 i. Divide this by 3, you're going to get 3. It's going to match exactly what we had before. So you can multiply by whatever you want. As long as you have the imaginary part in the bottom, it's going to clear the i, which is what you care about. So what you really want to do for any radical expression is get rid of the radical in the bottom. And because imaginary numbers are radicals, basically, square root of negative 1, you want to get rid of any imaginary numbers that are in the bottom. Anytime you multiply by whatever the imaginary part is in the bottom, you will always get rid of it, as we have done here. All right, one last thing I want to talk to you about. Some students will, some teachers will teach this. I don't really like to teach this, but you're going to notice it over time. Notice that I divided, I had an i in the bottom, and I don't like i's in the bottom, so I multiplied and then I brought it upstairs. Notice what really happened. When I brought the i upstairs, it became 2i. Or let me put it a different way. Compare this to the answer. The i moves in the process of multiplying. It moves upstairs. But in the process of it, everything gets multiplied by a negative 1, so this turned positive. Same thing happened here. This i, when you multiplied it, what ended up happening is it sort of moved upstairs, but in the process it multiplied by a negative. So the way I want you to solve your problems is I always want you to multiply by the imaginary number over itself or whatever to clear the denominator, as, as we're doing here. But in the back of your mind, I want you to, because you might be taught this, you can kind of think of just grabbing that i and moving it upstairs, but in the process you have to put a negative sign in front of the whole fraction. So if you didn't want to do all this multiplication, if you, as you get more practice, you can think of saying, okay, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to move it upstairs, but then I'm going to negate the whole thing. Here I'm going to grab this i, I'm going to move it upstairs, but I'm going to negate the whole thing. So that's always true. Anytime you multiply to clear the, uh, the imaginary number, in, in a pure imaginary number in the bottom, grab that negative one, move it upstairs, and you negate the whole thing. But in the beginning I want you to show your work. Uh, so you know where it's coming from. So this was just part one of several parts. We're simplifying expressions that involve imaginary numbers. Make sure you can solve every one of these, then follow me on to the next lesson. We're going to increase the complexity of these expressions so you get good practice. So follow me on and we'll do that right now.